Thank you very much for everyone who is joining us today. We will wait one more minute and then get started because we have an exciting speaker and it would be a shame to miss any minute. So you should be automatically muted. If not, please mute yourself. If possible, keep your camera on so that we have really the feeling that we're around the table and not around the computer. And in case of questions, please use the chat or raise your hand anytime. Hello, guys. <laughs> hey, how is it going? Look how many people. How Jordi, hi. <laughs> Where is that one? How many people do we have already? 25. 24. Okay. Um, all right. Should we get started, Christina? But uh, see, because we start by describing uh, <laughs> now ad nauseum the center. Yes, yeah, we can. That's so welcome again. And I will very shortly leave the floor to Masood, who is one of the early career researchers here at the center and who has a short video with a really interesting topic and then Damon will take over. And then we have a short Q&A where you can ask any additional questions. This is taking part within the Center for Social Norms and Behavioral Dynamics. And if you are interested to learn more, please scan our QR code or visit the link below. And here, this is a pre-sneak of everything that's coming up in the next few months. So make sure that you bookmark our website and that you keep us on the loop because there's a lot, a lot of interesting material in the making. And with that, please stay muted. If not automatically, then do it yourself. Keep your camera on. So uh, Cornelia, I'm trying to share my, oh, you're, are you still sharing screen? Yes. Okay. Give us one more second, because sure. then we also have the video of Masood which is about five minutes, and then we'll give you the floor. I see, okay. And we'll make you co-host. Thanks, Damon. So, and last but not least, all the recordings of today's sessions will be on the Center YouTube page. And with this, Masood, do you want to say anything since you're amongst us? Uh, hi, I just wanted to greet everyone. It's really nice to be here with you. Uh, my name is Masood Malbahed. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Social Norms and Behavioral Dynamics. It's a pleasure to present uh, through that video one of the uh, papers uh, on intergenerational income mobility, a racial spatial account. Uh, and uh, if you have any comments or questions, I will be delighted to talk about them, I'm available via email. I will share my email address via um, via text, via group message. Thank you all. I don't think the I think the video is muted. You need you need to share the screen with the sound on. When you share your screen, tick the box about sound.
It's very nice. It's very nice to be with you all. My name is Masood Movahed, and I'm a, a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Social Norms and Behavioral Dynamics. I recently defended my doctoral dissertation in sociology at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Uh, my work focuses on income inequality and intergenerational income mobility, as well as wealth inequality. Today, I'd like to present uh, one of my pa papers that focuses on the processes of intergenerational income mobility that was co-authored with a former colleague of mine, Tiffany Niman. The title of the paper is Intergenerational Income Mobility in the United States, a Racial Spatial Account. And if I show you a map of intergenerational income mobility in the context of the U.S., you will see that there is a great degree of spatial dependence. That is to say, counties and localities that are highly mobile, the darker shade, that are highly economically mobile, uh, are clustered together in the Midwest and in the Great Plain, and those that are less mobile or low mobi mobility counties are uh, clustering together in the South. And mobility here in this context means the mean income rank of individuals in adulthood who grew up to parents whose income was at the bottom 25 percentile. So we are looking at individuals mean income rank in adulthood, but we know as a matter of certainty that they grew up in households whose income was at the bottom 25 percentile. They grew up in households who were poor, uh, and that's that's a, a great and novel dimension of this new estimate of income mobility uh, that shows the upward trajectory of individuals across U.S. Uh, for both white and black children. So we substantiate our claim by conducting the Moranzai test, and Moranzai test signifies that there is a great degree of spatial dependence. And when there is a great degree of spatial dependence, conducting uh, or running regression models that are conventional, such as OLS, would be the violation of its major assumption, and that is the IID assumption, identically and independently distributed error terms. And that's not the case with the spatially dependent data. So we try to parameterize spatial proximity in order to account for this spatial uh, dependence to have less bias. Just give us one second, everyone. Expenditure uh, and low mobility counties for Uh, compute and aggregate at, uh, at, at county level uh, dependence to have less bias estimates uh, when we look at the determinants of intergenerational income mobility in the context of the U.S. We also have race-specific uh, uh, models. Uh, we do not assume that what predicts uh, income mobility for white individuals would be the same as that of black individuals. Uh, if I show you the map of uh, white mobility, only white children, you will see that there is a great degree of spatial dependence. Uh, counties that are mobile are in the Midwest and in the Great Plain region, uh, and low mobility counties for white children are in the South. So there is, again, a great degree of spatial dependence. For black mobility, that's less of a case because uh, there's a lot of missing data because there aren't sufficient number of African Americans residing in those counties to be able to meaningfully uh, compute and aggregate it uh, at, at county level. Raj Chetty, who produced this data, could not do this. And there is a great degree of missing data for only black mobility because, uh, again, lack of population uh, and lack of uh, number to compute it in a meaningful way. I'd like to talk about the independent variables that we have in this study. The outcome variable, as I said, is income mobility, income rank of individuals. That's the outcome variable. Our independent variables are as the following. Local government expenditure, local, not federal, local government, county government expenditure, local tax rates, social capital index, teacher student ratio, the uh, index of racial segregation, income inequality. We examine whether income inequality bears on mobility chances of individuals, unemployment rate, and manufacturing uh, changes in manufacturing employment because there is a lot of conversation that deindustrialization of the US is one of the reasons that uh, the financial security of households in the US are threatened. So we have a measure of that as well. 
um, there is a great degree of variation uh, across independent variables and across regions in the US. So the Northeast, for example, the green uh, color uh, in the bar plot has lowest level of uh, county level expenditure, but then uh, the Pacific region has the highest level. So there's a great degree of variation to across regions in the US. Uh, we draw on a spatial regime error model, and this uh, W here signifies the weight matrix, that the spatial weight matrix that parameterizes the spatial proximity of counties in order to give us less bias estimates. Uh, very briefly, I'd like to highlight the results of our study. Uh, if you compare the results for OLS, which is the orange uh, uh, coefficient, and then spatial error model, which is the spatial model that we draw on, you will see that there is a great degree of reduction in the effect size. So each independent variable has two coefficient because we run two models to compare them. And you know we'll see that uh, uh, OLS results are quite biased. Once we parameterize the space, the effect size reduces. Uh, for some of the variables. For manufacturing, for example, the effect size reduces. And uh, this reduction in the effect size is clear. One thing I'd like to highlight is that Gini coefficient positively predicts income mobility for white children. And so does racial segregation. Uh, cross model specifications, they they positively predict income mobility for white children. In other words, white people benefit from income inequality and segregation. White people benefit from these uh, 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 social problems. But then uh, black mobility, when we look at the uh, mobility for only black individuals, right, black you know, uh, race specific models, we'll see that uh, in the spatial model, local tax rate is not significant. The significance altogether faded away when we parameterize the space. And also uh, Gini coefficient and racial segregation that positively predicted white mobility, they turn negative. So black people suffer from income inequality across US counties in terms of mobility chances. They suffer from segregation, but white people uh, benefit from it. And that's substantiated through all of the uh, results that we have, the spatial results that we have. Uh, I'd like to uh, highlight uh, the major finding of our uh, study. Uh, there is a lot more in terms of regional analysis, but the major uh, findings are as the following. One is that we explicitly, this is the first study that parameterizes space uh, in order to understand mobility processes. And we notice that results are going to change once we parameterize the space. And we also have race specific models. We do not assume that what predicts income mobility for white children is the same as black children. And these are the major contributions of this study. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your time. Uh, if you would like to reach me, my email is available. I look forward to your comments. Thank you. Damon, the floor is yours. We are all ears. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, this is going to be a bit of a change. I guess I'm giving a talk after another talk. So um, <clears throat> what I'm going to do now is share screens. Let's see. Great. <clears throat> so everyone can see this on their screen, yes? Yes. Great. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about um, influence in social networks. And for those of you who know my work, uh, one of the things I focused on in the last couple of years is this idea of different kinds of contagions. And I'll talk just for a few minutes at the beginning here about that, so just to introduce the context. But what I'm really interested in is identifying this sort of problem that's been around for a very long time, which is, you know, <laughs> are there locations in social networks, are there people who are particularly influential? And you know, for about 50 years, we've we've had a very hard time doing this. It's been an idea that we've been trying to solve, but um, our problem we've been trying to solve with a certain concept, and it's it's never quite worked as well as people would hope. So, just to get into this a little bit, um, the question that we've been asking since really like the 1940s and 50s is. Well, look, you know, if we want to initiate the spread of a product or the initiation of a political campaign or the spread of a social movement, um, who are the key people we can target? And one of the core ideas that comes out of traditional psychology and marketing is that, well, there are certain people who are more charismatic, they're more interesting, they're more engaging, and those are the people who 
Today in our common nomenclature from social media, we're referred to as influencers. Um, but there was a big push in the, in the 1970s and 80s in, in what was then called, uh, you know, the sociology of networks and what is now called network science. Um, to sort of shift the thinking away from the traits and characteristics of people to looking at the broader structure of the network and identifying specific locations. And this was a this was a big change in thinking because the idea was it didn't really matter who the person was who occupied these specific spots. If you could locate the right spot, then anyone who was there would be influential. So it's this kind of structural concept of influence. And this is where the notion of centrality comes from. Is the notion that basically if you were highly central in the network, it was tantamount to saying you were highly influential in the network. Um, <clears throat> so Mark Granovetter's uh, very famous and publicized work called The Strength of Weak Ties identifies this concept as actually one of the key concepts behind sort of the weak ties notion. He says, look, since the resistance to a risky or deviant activity is greater <clears throat> than to a safer normal one, individuals with lots of weak ties right, going out in all directions, um, our best place to diffuse a difficult innovation. Um, so let's visualize that. So when we look at a social network, it's got lots of structure, people are, some people are more connected than others. And typically we identify people who are highly connected with this notion of centrality. And we can even have visualization strategies like the one I have here that put people with more connections in the middle of the, in the middle of the picture. So it sort of re reinforces and almost reifies the concept of centrality. And then we have people who are out there on what we might call the periphery, who have fewer connections, and also the connections look different. It's not just that they have fewer, but they're, they're sort of clustered together with lots of little triangles between them, whereas the people with many weak ties have ties going out in all directions. Um, <clears throat> and so the, in, you know, the intuition has been for a very long time that uh, so, you know, an idea or innovation pops up in a network, a person in the center learns about it very quickly because they've got like so many tentacles reaching out um, that then they can learn about it and spread it, right? And this is, I think, our common concept of, of diffusion. Um, and so the way it works is you sort of activate someone in the middle, they activate their peers, and it just spreads from the middle sort of outward throughout the network. Here's the problem. The problem is that when we look at the data from the diffusion of social movements, the change of innovations, adoption of new behaviors, particularly in health, um, what we see is that when we actually track the innovation through the network, it looks like this. It kind of takes hold out in this peripheral region and then starts to spread not to the center, but actually around the edge of the periphery and then reaches the center towards the end of the process. So this gives us like a really big <laughs> puzzle because Basically, all of our intuitions about how things spread um, with this notion of centrality and influence are wrong. And there's, an, there's, sort of, there's sort of an explanation that goes all the way back to the 60s and 70s, which is that essentially when an innovation is safe or when it conforms with our existing expectations, um, it's familiar, uh, then it does tend to spread from the central actors outward. Um, but when the innovation is riskier, it violates our norms or it's sort of, you know, uh, a contentious innovation like any kind of social change is. So think, for example, when I say safe innovation, think of like Kim Kardashian selling coconut water, right? It's like not a big stretch to buy one brand of coconut water versus another. When I say risky innovation, think of like joining Black Lives Matter and marching in the streets, right? It's initially a marginal innovation and it takes on more and more social legitimacy and then eventually spreads. So... For a highly essential actor, someone who's very well connected, early on, when this thing is not yet popular, not well known, and, and it's risky socially, those people, instead of being highly influential, they're actually highly constrained, right? And I'll, I'll explain that in just a moment. And what's interesting is there's actually a study from 1970. So the, the, think of the timing here. This is just before Granovetter's Strength of Weak Ties comes out. And Becker, um, Howard Becker says, Look, opinion leaders, and that was the term for influencers back then, um, they, prefer, they prefer normative, low-risk innovations, um, whereas high-risk innovations uh, tend to spread through local ties, um, and they're more secure against possible opposition, and they're more cosmopolitan peers. So he's basically pointing to those clustered peripheral networks and saying, well, that's where the high-risk stuff comes from. And the opinion leaders tend to sort of go with the safe stuff, the people in the center. So what that means here graphically is that when you have something in the periphery that's you know not well known or not well understood, 
that person in the middle, when they're considering whether to adopt it and spread it, all of those ties that appear to be outgoing ties for the spread of, let's say, coconut water, for the adoption, the public adoption of something like support for marriage equality, right, or support for Black Lives Matter, that's su um, subject to public scrutiny because all of those outgoing ties are also incoming ties. These are people watching you and commenting on you and evaluating you. And so what that means is the person in the center is actually tremendously constrained, right? So this flips our notion of social influence on its head, right? Because they're actually being um, highly influenced by the people around them. And these people are not gonna be opinion leaders, right? What they're gonna do is they're gonna wait. And so this idea, um, like I said, you know, was floated in the 70s and then Grand Better Strength of Weak Tide basically pushed really hard against this and said, no, 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 it's the people with weak ties who initiate change. And that became the dominant paradigm until this work that I've been doing in the last decade really pushed this idea that, well, that dominant paradigm works for things like coconut water and really doesn't work for things like social change. And when we look now more recently at technology adoption and social mobilization, innovation, and now we have much better data, we see consistently these things tend to spread from the periphery. So I just wrote a book on this called, and I'll talk about this at the end, but it's called Change, How to Make Big Things Happen. The book is all about, you know, the fact that there's this incredible tension between the picture on the left, where, you know, for the last, honestly, it's about 75 years, everything that people have been telling us inside the academy and, you know, now in marketing and, and sort of public, uh, you know, public discourse around uh, campaigns and politics and social movements have been arguing that things look like the picture on the left where everything spreads from the middle outward. But the data <laughs> consistently tell us that social change looks like the picture on the right that spreads from the outward, you know, outside inward. And, and in the way, in the book, I really framed it as this puzzle of the center versus the periphery. And what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna take a step forward. I'm gonna move past what I talked about in the book and past any talks I've given on this, you know, in the last couple of years where I've really emphasized simple and complex contagion, where I would say, well, the picture on the left is true for simple contagion, the picture on the right is true for complex contagion. What I'm gonna do is reframe, hopefully, your entire concept of what a network is and how it operates. Uh, so this this paper was just published in Nature Communication last year. So afterwards, we can talk about the you know technical details. But essentially, what I want to talk about is the center itself. Where is the center of the network? And the argument, and this is you know the argument made in the paper and that's alluded to in the book, is essentially that when we're talking about these different kinds of contagions, the center of the network is actually located in a different place. So we can talk about centrality and we can talk about influence but you can't talk about it independent of the kind of contagion that we're looking at. So very simply, this talk basically <laughs> has three easy steps. So first, I'm gonna just very quickly, because I think a lot of you probably already know this distinction, but I'm gonna talk very briefly about, you know, three slides on simple versus complex contagion. And then I'm gonna make this, this sort of turn that's, a new, that's in sort of a new position for this whole discussion, which is that the contagion that's spreading determines the connectedness of the network. This is a big deal because historically, and this is you know all the work I've done up till now, and all the work everyone's done <laughs> up till now in the field of network science argues that look, we can just talk about a network topology. It's got a structure. It's got you know nodes and edges, and then we just study like dynamics on top of that structure. And what I'm doing is challenging that uh, that whole paradigm and saying, look, actually the structure of a network, the actual distance and connectedness is determined by the contagion. So it changes. And then I wanna take a third step and say the connectedness of a network is what defines centrality. And the conclusion there at the end of this talk is gonna be that the contagion we're looking at determines where the center of the network is. Okay. All right, contagion, simple and complex, very briefly. Then I'm gonna get into sort of the mechanics um, at a very high level, talking about things that we all understand, um, about social connectedness, network centrality. And then, you know, this work has been pretty effective in terms of like touching the ground, the rubber meeting the road. So we've made predictions, the predictions have worked out, and I've also used this with teams doing practical implementations in Africa to diffuse um, uh, innovation. So it's got teeth to it. Um, okay, so contagiousness. Very quickly, um, probably the best way to set up the contrast between simple and complex is just to say, look, the novel coronavirus is a simple contagion. You talk to someone, 
they're infected. If you haven't gotten vaccinated and you're not wearing a mask, chances are you'll get infected. And uh, it doesn't matter what political party you belong to. It doesn't matter what country you're from, right? All these sort of social distinctions are irrelevant. You, you have contact in the relevant way and, you know, transmission occurs. And that's the sort of principle of simple contagion. It basically stuff spreads like a virus. Then look at like the history, particularly at the beginning of the pandemic, we all experienced this. That like a couple of years ago, face masks became like this major political issue, which who could have predicted that, right? I mean, if we're all thinking about the universe as simple contagions, there's no way that something like wearing a face mask becomes adopted by one group and then another group like oppositionally doesn't adopt it. And then you get these sort of social divisions around face masks. So clearly the spread of the behavior of wearing a face mask behaves fundamentally differently than the spread of the coronavirus itself. And that is like a really good way of conceptualizing the difference between a simple contagion and a complex contagion. Simple contagions just graphically work exactly the way that like your textbook model of contagion works. Someone shows up, they're infected, and this is true for things like gossip and viral videos too. They show up, they have a, you know, have a simple sort of tale to tell, or they're infected with, you know, the influenza virus or measles. They infect a person, that person's highly connected, they infect everyone else they know. Right. And that seems like super straightforward. The thing to keep in mind is there are a lot of assumptions built in there, both mathematical assumptions, but more importantly, social assumptions. Right. We're assuming that like coming into contact with something is the same as adopting it, which, again, certainly true for really infectious things like the measles, not true for things like face masks. Right. Um, so when we move beyond, you know, stuff that's easy and familiar and low cost, then we're in the space of complex contagion, where someone shows up. Now imagine the person in the middle and all the people are shown in gray are not wearing face masks. This is back in like whatever, 2019, 2020. Now the person who shows up in black is wearing a face mask. The person in the center doesn't just see one adopter. What they also see is all of the other non-adopters, right? So everyone who's not wearing a face mask, they don't have to you know, carry picket signs and advertise for not wearing face masks. The simple fact that they're not wearing face masks puts social pressure on the person in the middle to sort of wonder about the legitimacy uh, socially of this new behavior of wearing a face mask. So probably if everyone I know is not wearing masks, the person who shows up wearing a mask is not gonna be very influential. And maybe a second person adopts, but there's still some social resistance. And finally, half their network is wearing face masks. And at this point, maybe they go along. All right, so what's happened is, from a simple technical perspective, you can just say, oh, there's a threshold. Look, a sufficient number of people need to adopt before you adopt, but it's deeper than that. Is that the people who are not doing something are actively doing work, even though they're not doing any kind of social behavior. What they're doing is they're providing a kind of social context that is countervailing against this innovation. And this is true for anything that invokes issues of credibility or legitimacy, or you know, it's a kind of a big word we use as complementarity, but it basically just means think of a social media platform. If everyone in gray is using Facebook and someone shows up when they're using um, like the, the, uh, the Google technology, Google Plus, like, sure, that's interesting, but everyone else you know is on Facebook, you're not gonna switch because of one person. It's a similar kind of thing. Like you need enough reinforcement to kind of pull you over to switch. Um, and it behaves the same way. So there are lots of kind of what are referred to as mechanisms for just for like why we would resist change. And this is all described in detail in, in the book, right? But so the point is that these show up in like real life in an everyday way. We all experience it. And, and it's formalized in a very specific way in this model, but it's, it's really quite general. Um, and so in other talks and in the book, I discussed the entire book is dedicated to all of these things. But now I'm going to move beyond that. Now I'm gonna talk about what this means for social connectedness. So let's look at a graph. And this is stuff you've kind of, in any network science class, you have like, okay, there's a bunch of nodes, a bunch of people, links or social relationships. There's a person A and a person B, and it's a tie between them. So if we ask a question like, what's the distance between A and B? Uh, it's a pretty easy question to answer. We say, well, like the distance is the number of steps you have to travel through the network, right? So it's, you know, basically across the bridge that goes from A to B. Now for a simple contagion, because a simple contagion only requires a single contact, every single link in the network is a bridge. 
But for complex contagions, you need multiple reinforcing contacts. So a single link from A to B isn't actually a bridge, right? And that's, this is going to be really important now in the next step. So when we talk about simple paths, so the notion of path length has, has been rudimentary for social science, particularly for network science. It was invented in, in early 1950s, and it's been the same concept that Granovetter used and the small, small Worlds model used. It's been the same concept for you know, 70 years. Um, and it works like this. You have it, A and A's friends are showing red and they're like activated. They're trying to spread something. But let's say they're activated with like the measles. Well, A interacts with B, there's a narrow bridge. So the path between A and B is a single step, right? Sufficient for transmission. But now let's talk, this is the new concept, complex paths. So now if we're in a similar situation where A and A's friends are sort of activated, but what they're trying to spread is like participation in Black Lives Matter. Well, A can tell B, but B's got a lot of other contacts who aren't engaged in this thing. So B's like, sure, I get that you're doing this, but I don't, no one else I know is doing this. So now if this is gonna really spread through the network, it has to spread through reinforcing contacts from A's neighborhood. So how does it spread? What are the bridges that are gonna carry this through the network? Well, actually it spreads through like this overlapping neighborhood. That's one step, then a second step, a third step, fourth step, fifth step, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth. So if you were to ask the question, how many steps from A to B for the influenza virus to spread? Well, it's one step. And you say, how many steps to the network for Black Lives Matter to spread? It's nine steps, which means the very concept of social difference, uh, distance is different for the simple contagion versus the complex contagion. Now, this is really significant because we've all heard of, you know, the Milgram study and six degrees of separation. The Milgram study was looking at the spread of information. He was looking at people getting a postcard and then sending the postcard to somebody else and just kind of notifying them um, until it traversed a sufficient number of ties. So that six degrees of separation is assuming that we're talking about simple contagions. And that's huge because it means that every single measure of social distance that's ever been used since then has always assumed simple contagion. And so this is, means that like when we're trying to use these network measures and these sort of topological conceptions to understand the growth of Black Lives Matter or of Arab Spring, we're fundamentally using the wrong concept of social distance. Okay, so now let's talk about what this means for diffusion. So when we have a neighborhood on the lattice, you have an individual A with two neighbors on the left and two neighbors on the right, and B with two neighbors on the left and two on the right, and these common neighbors or shared friends. Now, if we assume a simple contagion with, let's say, a threshold of two, then A and a A's friends you know, adopt the innovation, um, and then they can convince B and B's friends. But the reason they can do it is because there's a wide bridge with multiple reinforcing paths from A's friendship network to B's friendship network. Now let's say we rewire the, we re, um, rewire the network. So now we have these sort of long distance ties, these weak ties flying all over the network. That's supposed to be better for diffusion, right? In our classical concept. And it's supposed to make, if A has a lot of these, it makes A more central and therefore more influential. But now there's only one link. There's only one common neighbor between A and B. So although information and viruses can spread, there's actually insufficient social reinforcement to spread the contagion to B's neighborhoods. So it actually stops. Right? This is something I've written a lot of papers about. The diffusion actually slows down and ultimately stops when you add more of these weak ties into a network. So <clears throat> what this means is if we want to measure diffusion, we want to use this notion of complex paths, not simple paths. And uh, this idea of bridge width or wide bridges is incredibly um, efficient for predicting successful cascades. So the, the black line here is as we rewire a network in kind of the standard small world model going from a you know, structured lattice to a random network, we see that the frequency of successful cascades actually plummets down to zero. Um, and we say, well, what network measure can capture that? It turns out if you measure the frequency of wide bridges across the topology, it's a perfect match for capturing the changing cascade frequency. So this topological property of the network is a very good job of capturing the sort of diffusion process in the network. It turns out like to the, you know, the sort of continuum from the lattice network to the random network is a small chunk of the entire space of networks, but you can do this with any graph. You can do this with graphs of 
arbitrary or exponential degree distribution. Here you can do it with scale-free graphs. The, the dynamics are the same. That basically, if you look at the frequency of wide bridges or complex paths, it really, really uh, very well predicts the proportion of adoption in, in the network. So now what I want to do is, now that I've established step, you know, step one, which is this difference between simple and complex, and step two, which is that you know, the contagion determines connectedness, now I want to get to step three, which is the core, which is that the contagion determines centrality. All right, so this is the typical thing we do. And for any of you who take a network science class, you will do this exercise. People give you a graph, and then they say, OK, uh, here's this measure of centrality. Uh, let's call it eigenvector centrality. And then you do the calculations, and you say, OK, node D has the highest eigenvector centrality. And they say, OK, what about between the centrality? OK, node H has that. And we just sort of we iterate through it. And then every year, more, <laughs> more definitions and more measures of centrality are calculated. So there's a long list of centrality measures. Um, <clears throat> Now, the thing to note is that they are all really similar. Sometimes they even overlap, that like eigenvector will pick up the same exact node as degree. Um, and we spend a lot of time quibbling over like whether betweenness is better, or closeness is better, and so forth. Every single one of these measures and every other measure that I'm not measuring um, assumes that a single tie in the network is a sufficient bridge. In other words, Every single measure of centrality assumes that what we're looking at is simple contagion. So that's, you know, we discussed this in detail in the paper. But um, the point here is to realize that although we spend a lot of time, you know, uh, slicing hairs here to make, you know, make different motions of centrality seem important, they're basically doing all the same kind of thing. So what I want to introduce here is a new concept of centrality. And if I put it on the on the sort of figure like this, it just looks like one more measure of centrality to add to the list. Okay, what's different about it is this notion of centrality assumes that we need reinforcing wide bridges to spread anything. So unlike every other measure, a single tie in the network is not sufficient for transmission. Right, and so this gets really interesting when you start moving to the empirics because, you know. You've seen enough of these theory talks to know that like you can build any measure you want. You can say lots of like things about it that you think are important. It doesn't really matter unless you can take this measure, put it into an empirical context and show that it makes a difference. So um, the first place to start is this tremendous resource that we have uh, in sociology, which is the Ad Health Network. This was built by Peter Bierman. Um, he basically just went around collecting all these adolescent health networks from, from high schools and built this massive database, which is now like a gold standard for measuring um, social connectedness. And people use it, as we have here, to say, all right, we have these networks. They're empirical networks. Um, now that we've sort of sampled the entire space of computationally generated networks, we can sort of just test it to say, all right, if we look at the different measures of centrality and pick those people, the, you know, the highest degree centrality, the highest eigenvector centrality, the highest, you know, between the centrality as seeds for, you know, initiating some kind of behavior change cascade, um, which locations are going to be the optimal locations for that kind of change initiative. And, you know, uh, in terms of the threshold distribution, we're looking at complex contagions across this huge range of two, three, four, five, six. We look at um, thresholds that are basically what are called absolute thresholds where you need two people or three people, and then fractional thresholds where you need like some percent of your neighbors. Um, seed this active neighborhood and then see what spreads the best. So for instance, um, this is you know a real ad health network. Um, you can see degree centrality and eigenvector centrality pick the same node. And again, in terms of the graphic visualization, that node is in the quote unquote center of the network. So you know it resonates with our uh, visual intuitions about centrality, but it's really just a measure of the number of connections you have or the number of connections that your neighbors have. Um, then there's between a centrality and percolation centrality. What you'll notice is that although they pick out different nodes, they're all kind of clustered around what looks like the center of the network. If you look at complex centrality, it picks a qualitatively different part of the network. It's what is visualized as the periphery. Right, so that's interesting. It's something that's like way out there. 
Um, and then we run these simulations and we say, okay, now we initiate these diffusion cascades, um, which of these locations is gonna be most effective? So this is what the sort of, you know, beginning or the initial conditions of the, each of these um, trials look like. So degree centrality, you activate the node and its neighbors between this percolation and so forth. When you look at the actual diffusion success, and again, we're looking at complex contagion, we're looking at contagions that require social reinforcement to spread, you basically get not much purchase on the network from using these locations. Now you lose complex centrality, which is way out there in the periphery, and you get something that looks like this. You get like huge impact across the network. That, of course, this you know visualization is just one simulation, so we can look at hundreds of simulations. So this is every single possible combination across every single network, 74 networks, every single threshold distribution replicated. And what you see is really quite striking, which is that the only measure of centrality that actually has like above 75%, like really gets major purchase on diffusion in the network is complex centrality. I'm gonna unpack this even more looking at some of the um, empirical experiments that we ran. One of the interesting things here too, is if you look at which measures of centrality capture the kind of intuitions that the other measures of centrality capture, you see, well, okay, if like degree, if you look at <clears throat> the red bar is eigenvector centrality and the green bar is degree centrality. And if you look at panel C, you can see that like they're both kind of high and actually percolation centrality is kind of high too. So all those measures of centrality are kind of picking up on the same things and they're picking the same parts of the network. What's compelling here is that the, the cyan or the light blue, that's complex centrality. And you'll notice it's low on every single other score of centrality. So complex centrality is like fundamentally picking up something different than the other notions of centrality. And then, you know, again, what, you know, you, I feel like the, the project here, and I think this, this is what we did, you know, throughout the paper was to say, all right, each step is to move from a more thorough, rigorous analytical take on this um, into a, a sort of messier, more empirical space and show that these analytical intuitions and computational intuitions really have traction. We start looking at like, you know, real empirical diffusion processes. So this is a data set <clears throat> that was collected by Banerjee et al. Um, it got a lot of attention. It was in science uh, and they did a beautiful, Esther Duflo was on this and, uh, and Matt Jackson was on, these are really, you know, serious people. And they did this beautiful job of collecting <clears throat> these, uh, these data from 43 different villages. And, uh, you know, Esther spent a long time doing this work in India, where she, it's part of the reason why she won the Nobel. She, said all this she, she basically set up these data collection um, factories across all these different villages so that like really clean data could be collected on like every single network tie and every single step in adoption, which is historically very hard to do in like, you know, in, in non sort of closed experimental context. Um, so we have complete adoption of network data, sorry, complete network data and complete adoption data. And so we can look at the diffusion process across all these different networks and then use our, um, our measure to make predictions. Now, of course, you know, this was done in 2013. So we have the data and we already have our measure and our measure is defined internally. So then we can just ask the hard question, like does our measure do a good job of making predictions for these data? Um, and they do a great job. So if you look at the average complex path length, it is highly predictive of the actual proportion of adopters um, that, that, that sort of um, across all the 43 villages. Now more compelling, if you compare across the full data set, the individual households where, and this is kind of like the simulations we ran in, in, in the at health data, except now we're looking at empirical data. And you say, all right, if you were to choose this household or that household based on high betweenness centrality or high degree centrality, how effective would that have been in diffusing? And what they're looking at here is a microfinance program that's spread in India. How effective would that have been in spreading this microfinance uh, program? And the random baseline here is using no measure of centrality at all and picking a random node. And the most striking thing is that every other measure of centrality can't predict any significant effect of choosing a central node versus choosing a random node on spreading the microfinance program. The 
only measure of centrality that has any difference from the random baseline is complex centrality. And of course, the reason for this, this is not just like a random discovery, this is theoretically predicted because the microfinance program is a complex contagion, it requires social reinforcement. And so complex centrality does a better job at predicting the households you should target as your sort of lead households for influencing adoption within those villages. So now the final stage of this talk <clears throat> is to move into sort of what we can call the policy space, which is, all right, well, now that you know this, now that you've got, you know, a model, you've got, a, you know, a, a formal proof, a set of computational studies and a set of like empirical confirmations, how would you go about applying this? So I talk about this in detail in the book. I, I give this sort of a long, a long story of this study in Malawi. Uh, and this is interesting for anyone who's for anyone who's sort of thinking about sustainability issues. This is like the kind of case that you that you want to think about, which is um, <clears throat> this was in Malawi, and essentially they were using a planting technique that was incredibly inefficient. They were generating pretty much only twenty percent of what they could generate with their you know existing arable land. But more importantly, um, you know it was really subject to soil erosion. It was low yield, and it was um, you know. It's a place where there's actually a tremendous fertility to the land and there's also food shortage. It just doesn't make sense, right? It just use a different farming technique and a lot of problems are solved. So for almost a decade, the government had been doing out outreach in exactly the way that you would predict, right? The government sent emissaries that would go to these villages and say, you should use this other planting technique. It's gonna be much better. You're gonna have a much higher yield. And after almost a decade, they had less than 1% of farmers actually adopting. And, you know, now we're back to like simple and complex contagion, right? Because it's like, why don't they adopt? It's going to save them money. It's going to save them effort. It's the best thing they could possibly do. Well, ask yourself why people don't get vaccinated, right? It's the same issue. It's like once people believe something because their neighbors believe it and so on and so forth, you're no longer in an economic space of just give people money and they'll do it you're in a social influence space where people are paying attention to their neighbors and all their neighbors are using the same planting technique that their grandparents and their grandparents' grandparents used. So they're not going to be the ones to change. Um, first of all, they'll look weird. And second of all, if it fails, they'll look stupid, right? So the question is, what can you do to increase adoption in a situation where all of the cultural, historical, and social factors reinforce you know, uh, inertia? So the standard strategy was to use influencers. And this is what the government did. They found the people in those communities who are the highest you know, status, most charismatic people. And they said, hey, would you, you know, adopt this, this kind of planting technique or you know, at least advertise it to everyone else in the community? Um, so this is the influencer strategy. Right? We've all kind of seen this. You have a network, you have someone who's clearly more central than everybody else. And you say, let's just activate that person now, the story I told at the beginning was like, well, the, these people who are more connected are like, you know, they're, they're reluctant. They're less likely to adopt something that's different or controversial. But I think the standard response here, particularly in policy settings, is, well, we've got a bucket of cash. So instead of like trying to distribute that over the population, we're just going to give that to this one person and the rest will take care of itself. And it should look something like this, where like that person is so incredibly effective that like they spread this thing throughout the network. Now... <clears throat> I've emphasized this difference between simple and complex, what it means for topology. This can all seem kind of nuanced when you move in the space of policy. The space of policy is so focused on like the details of Malawi and the details of like the farmers and the farming culture that this network talking seem kind of high-minded. And what a lot of people do in this situation, and this is true in marketing in the US as well, what a lot of people do is they say, well, sure, I get simple and complex. And these are sort of technical distinctions that academics make. But look, why can't we just spend money on everything? Like, we'll just do the kitchen sink. Like, sure, maybe this is a complex contagion. But what's the harm at, at, like, trying to get an influencer involved? We'll just we'll try that because people are talking about that. And there's a lot of support for it. Um, this is exactly what, what Google did with Google Glass. And so it, it's a cautionary tale. Because what they did was they said, we're going to use high status influencers in Silicon Valley to spread this great new technology that's very expensive. But if we get the high status influencers to adopt, everyone will adopt. As many of you may recall, or at least have heard about, what happened with Google Glass wasn't that it just didn't work as well as it could have. What happened with Google Glass was that there was a huge cultural backlash because the idea that you would use 
these eyeglasses to like surveil the visual technology or sorry, sur surveil the visual environment and then record it was perceived as like a tremendous violation of social norms. Now, Google wasn't taking social norms into account. They were just talking about a cool new technology. But the backlash was so severe that like storefronts and coffee shops would put in like um, banners on, the, on their front door saying like, you can't come in here if you're wearing glass. And the term glass hole was invented as a description of these people. And the backlash was so severe that not only did Google shut down the product line, but Google's reputation as a company took like a major hit because it was viewed as like a tech juggernaut selling surveillance technology to the rich, right? So the point is when you're dealing with complex contagions, you can't just take a kitchen sink approach and like just, you know, throw simple contagion strategies and complex contagion strategies. You actually have to think quite carefully about what you're doing. So here's the same graph we were just looking at. And now here's, you know, the sort of complex contagion situation where you know, the center of the network for a simple contagion is not the center of the network for a complex contagion. In fact, if you try to spread it from the center, you may get one or two people. But remember, those people also have countervailing influences and all their neighbors have countervailing influences. So the norms are pretty much going to like lock in and push back pretty hard. This is the most compelling part of the story. You take the same network with the same level of resistance and now pick this cluster out here, which looks incredibly unimportant from like a classic centrality point of view. And now you initiate a cascade. What winds up happening is it doesn't just jump to the center. It spreads around the periphery and builds what is tantamount to a critical mass. And it, as it cascades and reaches that critical mass, then it speeds up and then it spreads across the center and reaches the rest of the population. The point is when you're dealing with social norms, you have to think of this as like a progressive social change process, not as something you do instantaneously and virally. Right. And so we applied this idea or a series of a, a group of economists using this complex contagion strategy, applied it to the problem in Malawi. Um, so they did this. This was a, a kind of an amazing effort. This was like four years full, like full in group of economists. They went to 50 villages and put they went to 200 villages across the country and then broke them up into experimental conditions, like a really nice kind of economic style field experiment where they broke the, the entire nation up into these like four quadrants and 50 villages were using the viral strategy, 50 villages used the influencer strategy, 50 villages used the complex strategy, they also tried like a geographic strategy. Um, and so this is what they look like. The degree, you know, the kind of influencer strategy was choosing a high, you know, very central person. The viral strategy was just choosing people at random. And the idea there is just, you know, again, very much like the disease metaphor, just get as much distribution as possible, much coverage on the network. And then the complex centrality, which is like, pick this cluster way out here that no one thinks is going to do anything. Um, and the results are really quite striking, which is, you know, why I talk about this example in detail in the book, because like the first year in the, in the, the group, the sort of experimental condition that was the complex centrality seating, um, you have basically a 200% increase in just people's awareness and understanding of the innovation. Understanding means like, you know what it is, you know how it works, you know, you know the idea behind it, not just that you've heard of it. And then by the second year, that, that understanding or knowledge of the innovation translated into uptake. You saw this like great uptake. So year after year, they came back to the village and like interviewed everyone and talked to them. Um, and then by the final year, uh, you actually saw a really, um, impressive change where the villages, interestingly enough, that used the 50 villages that used the influencer strategy were worst of all. They had no change whatsoever. The villages that used the viral strategy, um, which is the random baseline, were basically up like the influencer, but slightly above, which is really interesting. If you think of that, the influencer is like the worst case. And then by a large margin, the complex centrality uh, villages were, you know, massively um, improved in terms of uptake of this of this planting innovation uh, by about 300 percent. So what this means is when we look at these kinds of networks and we think strategically about what we can do and about the concept of the influencer um, and people who study behavioral economics will appreciate this point. There's no way to sort of undo the cognitive bias visually. You look at these two networks and is just in, a, in a kind of an obvious way, clear that the, the left-hand network has someone at the middle who should be an influencer. That's what, that's what influencers look like. Um, and I want to suggest that our whole conception of networks is subject to the same kinds 
of cognitive biases that plague other kinds of decision making as well. And even though all your intuitions pull towards the left, it's actually the network on the right where you're going to have much greater effectiveness choosing uh, an influential individual to, to sort of, or, or you know, neighborhood to, to sort of change the behaviors in the rest of the network. Um, and so the punchline here is that when we're talking about network structure, we are uh, fundamentally talking about the kinds of contagions. And when we're talking about path length, every single study that uses the word path length up till this one, up till 2021, there was, you know, you can basically say simple path length because every time the term path length is used, what they're actually saying is simple path length. And complex path length is an, is an entirely different measure of network distance. And of course, that ultimately translates into a measure of network centrality. All this stuff is discussed in my book. Um, importantly, uh, that website there is the Network Dynamics Group. That's my research lab, the Network Dynamics Group website. And uh, we post all of our data and all of our scripts and all the information for our studies. So if you're interested in you know, looking deep, more deeply into the data, the simulations, the information for it, it will be found there. And just as a reference for the studies, um, all the papers are available there for free download too. So this is the paper Nature of Communications that details what I talked about today, topological measures for identifying and predicting for complex contagions. Um, and then what I did not talk about today, but it may be of interest to people, is the, the newer work that um, I'm doing on uh, collective intelligence. And for the last about five, six years, we've been developing a, a kind of a program of research that studies collective intelligence, the wisdom of the crowds through the lens of network science. And it's kind of shifted the the discussion away from the kind of the classical classical ideas about how the wisdom of crowds actually works. Um, okay, so with that, I'm happy to take your questions. Fabulous. It's absolutely amazing. Um, Christina, do you want to go first before I start to bring up the questions that were put in the chat? Thank you was raising my hand high down. <laughs> um, so um, I sort of agree uh, with uh, what you say out of experience, actually, out of practical experience. And, uh, but let's go to your argument. Uh, so first of all, complex contagion uh, involves typically situation where they can be resistant to change, OK? Yep. And the resistance can be of uh, many uh, many uh, sorts. You know, it can be high risk, or it can be social non-change. Social non-change, you know, not descriptive, but social non-change. Uh, you know, there is usually resistance, and certainly somebody at the center of the network won't risk uh, moving things over. So, agreed. Uh, so, peripheral change in the complex contagion model seem to drive overall change. So you are more in the periphery of the network, true. Now, the problem is uh, uh, to spread overall, we need critical numbers. Right. Uh, I always need a critical number. And uh, so what you seem to say is that it's easier uh, to form criticality in the periphery Okay, uh, then in the center, I agree. But still, people do have thresholds. And, you know, this distribution of thresholds does matter. Mm -hmm. And so the question to me is always yes, I see something happen in a periphery. Uh, yes, it may spread, but it may not. Okay. So what are the critical elements? Uh, and uh, maybe a critical element is that we are lucky with the distribution of thresholds. You know, you cannot predict it. Exante, obviously. Uh, is it that, uh, or is there something about, uh, you know, creating a critical mass in a periphery that's really move things along? This is a question, you know, because you have yeah. that. But how comes that it then spread everywhere? Thank you. Yeah, that, no, that's a, that's a great question. And so um, you've anticipated one of those sort of deep points that uh, that is the paper is really focused on this contagion process. But um, the book 
uh, actually has the chapter on critical mass dynamics followed by the chapter on these kinds of uh, complex centrality seating, because those two actually do go together exactly like, like you're describing. So we published other papers. We had a 2018 paper in science, you know, identifying this sort of tipping point. And we did a bunch of experiments. It's not the paper I'm talking about today, but it is in, you know, in the book where we identified this sort of around 25% tipping point. And that's, you know, when I talk about that stuff, I actually use mm. some of the same graphics I showed you because when I talked about the case of like seating in the periphery and you can see how it spreads around the periphery and then reaches what is a tantamount to a critical mass and then spreads through, the key concept to make that work is that you've got wide bridges connecting the areas in the periphery. So essentially this notion of complex path length is the measure that tells us whether a, a sort of peripheral seeding process will translate into a critical mass that will take over the rest of the population. And this is very important because basically once you're past the 25% threshold, if you get that many adopters, then all of a sudden the thresholds become less significant because you've got so many adopters that like you're triggering lots yeah. of people from lots of sides. So really the heart, it's like you have to think of like diffusion and social change as like the hard problem and the easy problem. Like if you start off with 75% adopting, it's not a very hard, hard problem to get the rest of the 25%. The hard problem is where you've only got a small cluster of people trying to initiate change. Now, I, I spent some time in the book talking about Black Lives Matter um, because it's such an interesting case. Because in, 20, you know, in 2014, just prior to Ferguson, um, uh, Eric Gardner was killed in, in New York City. And he was, he was strangled to death by a police officer on videotape and that videotape was uploaded. So a lot of people, when they think about um, uh, the 2020 protests and how they spread across the world, say, well, it was because this video had been uploaded on the web. It's not true. Like the same thing happened in 2014. And Eric Gardner, there was some protests in New York City, there were some protests elsewhere, but like New York is such an epicenter. You would think that like, if anything was gonna happen, it would happen there, but it didn't happen there. It happened in Ferguson, Missouri, which is nowhere. And that was where really Black Lives Matter took off. So the question is why, right? It just, it violates our intuition. And the reason is because what happened over that time, particularly during the weeks in Ferguson, is that the, the, the social media networks, particularly on Twitter, got wider and wider bridges for groups that weren't talking to each other, like celebrities, black activists, black youth, white liberal groups, um, the general resistance groups like Anonymous, all these groups were having their own conversations about police violence and about brutality in the black community. And all of a sudden in Ferguson, like these people started talking to each other, just regular citizens having conversations. And it just shifted the, the sort of the capacity of this network as a whole. Then bridges became wide enough that you got this sort of critical mass phenomenon growing and growing and growing until by 2015, the White House has to pay attention to this conversation. And I think for a lot of people who weren't aware of these issues, they were like, why are um, this is thing of, of violence in the black community? It's, it's uh, this new phenomenon. Like obviously anyone who knows anything knows that this is not a new phenomenon, right? It's something that's it's a very old phenomenon, but the critical mass networks formed sufficiently to then make it something that everyone had to deal with. And by 2020, you had this, you had this thing that in 2014, they did a poll and the vast majority of Americans said, um, yeah, there isn't a real problem of police violence in black neighborhoods. And these protests around Black Lives Matter are just, you know, disgruntled people, you know, misunderstanding the fact that like these, these youths are committing crimes and they're just sort of being self-important about it. By 2020, only six years later, seven, this is a New York Times poll, only 78% uh, of Americans, Democrat and Republican, said that they thought that there was a serious problem of police violence in black neighborhoods and the Black Lives Matter protests were justified. At six years, that's in, it's an incredible scope of change. And the only thing that changed was like the networks that sort of gave sort of a structural capacity for initiating this kind of critical mass dynamic. Um, so Christina, you're exactly right. It's, it's pretty much what this talk is about, is like these measures of bridge width and, and complex path lane give us the structural um, underbelly of like how this critical mass process happens. And once you get enough, then the rest of the sort of cascade process takes off. Yeah. More questions? Definitely, and plenty. Um, Daniel, how closely is the spatial distribution related to resource discovery? 
Oh, this one is. Uh, that's from the previous talk. Yeah, that's from the previous talk. Okay. Did you apply machine learning techniques, shallow or deep? Um, so is that for me as well? Yes. Okay. Um, so the this kind of work is not data driven; it's theory driven, right? So our our research was based on the theory of complex contagion, based on a series of uh, analytical proofs, and the proofs are in the paper. Um, and then when we were doing the work on the um, at health networks, those were based on computational simulations that were new, basically numerical studies that were based on the analytical work. Um, and so we were able to then further test those against the experimental data. Um, so there is no data science component to this. And this is important actually, I think for a lot of people who, when they think of computational social science, it's all, you know, there's so much going on, it's all kind of a blur. Um, but uh, methodologically and scientifically, it's useful to know that um, one of the challenges with the data science approach is that you're always kind of looking backward. You know, and sort of looking at like, what are the data has told us and you know, what, what is available in the data to make an inference. And this kind of science is, is more like traditional science. We're like, we're developing a body of theory and developing um, importantly boundary conditions for when we think it works, when we think it doesn't work. And unlike data science, which develops these correlations but doesn't really know why they work, the point here is like there's an underlying theory of behavior change of like individual behavior change embedded in social networks and why it happens and why it doesn't and that's motivating all of our empirical ex explorations so lots on the line here because you know you can test it and find out you're wrong um and there certainly have been things like the work we did in tipping points there's a very interesting scientific story there of like one of the models we were using had these very strong predictions and we ran these experiments and those predictions were wrong. And so we, we realized that we hadn't properly taken into account the, like, the right model of complex contagion, how it worked in the case of tipping points. Um, so there's a real learning process in developing like a, a broad and, and substantial theory that sits underneath this. Um, so it was not, this isn't, this isn't a data driven, this is a, a theory driven, um, uh, piece of work, which is to my mind very satisfying because then when policy challenges come up, like the one in Malawi, you can not only say, well, this strategy will work, you can explain why it will work, and you can also understand if there are cases where it may not work, and you can anticipate that as opposed to always learning after the fact. I'm happy to take other questions. Did the notion of Kinkit's um, bounded normative influence have an impact on your work? Did the, did, the, did the notion of what? Um, Sean, maybe you want to go into more details because you have written a long post Absolutely. here. Yeah, so sorry for the long question. Notion. Yeah, uh, hi Dr. Santolis. So I'm thinking about you know the why question because when I read your paper, I saw that, okay, locations with low between the centrality and I forget the other centrality, they seem to be the most influential and I'm trying to understand why. And it seemed like your work is kind of the modern version or building strongly upon What's, uh, what's called the theory of bounded normative influence by Kincaid in 2004, where he kind of showed that social norms seem to spread in small bounded networks where the minority kind of becomes the majority and then slowly they spread to others around them and then eventually they influence the whole network. So I was just wondering if you ever came across these ideas when you were doing your own work. Yeah, so Kincaid was working um, back with um, uh, um, the author of the diffusion of innovation um and they were one of the original studies i think the only like really big study rogers, they did was on yeah rogers right and the only really big study they did it and rogers uh back in the 80s was the study of the spread of birth control in korea um and i actually spent a large part of the book talking about that example um because there were so many interesting and important lessons what they didn't have was like a fleshed out network theory but they had really nice data and, and nice intuitions. Um, and actually, uh, the reason I talk about them in the book is because um, the network theory uh, really does a good job of explaining why they found success in the cases they found success, why it didn't work in the cases where it didn't work. And also, interestingly, one of the nice examples um, that comes out of that study was, uh, was contrary to like another, you know, I think chapter two or chapter three in the book is called um, the myth of stickiness, 
because one of the stories we tell ourselves today is if you just design the perfect product, then like it'll spread everywhere, right? And what I point out in the book is like this, believe it or not, this actually is tied to the concept of virality. It doesn't seem like it is, but it is. Because it's like, if you just, you know, design like a really infectious thing, uh, then it'll spread. Um, but some of the most interesting cases like that case showed that in some villages, uh, when they had the menu of contraceptive um, uh, methods, you know, the IUD spread a lot in one village and everyone adopted IUD. But then in another village, everyone adopted condoms. And in another village, everyone adopted a different method. It was like, well, so that's weird because you're getting successful adoption, but it's clearly not that there's like one magical method. Um, and so what was going on was it was more the norm the norm that was spreading of like a group of people adopted this, they got a cluster, it was reinforced and, and the whatever method happened to be adopted in that cluster became um, emblematic or symbolic of the norm of birth control. And so everyone just used that. Um, and so to me, it's a really powerful lesson of how if you wanna change social norms, the thing to think about is like, what is that process of social reinforcement or the networks that reinforce them? And that's much more important than like the thing itself. And so, yeah, um, the work by Kincaid and Rogers was really helpful for helping to flesh that out. Thanks very much. Yeah. Alberto, what impact does calculating the complex degree have when we have access to the incomplete network? Yeah, network completeness is a huge issue in, in policy. Um, and this is something that's been around since like the late 90s. Everyone was talking about like network, network imputation methods, how to infer like what, what network ties are missing. Um, and you can tell by the fact that this is still an ongoing conversation that like nothing terribly satisfying has been developed. Um, this is something people think about like in biology and physics too. It's not just, it's, it's a general sort of network science problem. Um, and uh, there are some kinds of properties of networks. You can say, well, if we get this statistic right, then everything else doesn't matter. And I think this is one of the more powerful things about the science of networks that's often overlooked which is that you don't need to have perfect network data to know what's gonna happen on a network. You just have to have the right network data, right? If you can measure a certain statistical property, so classically in the small world space, people say, well, path length, we just measure path length, we know how fast things will spread. Well, if you look at how path length is actually calculated, it's literally just taking a walk through the network. It's just saying, you know, I step across here, 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 and trying every possible path until you find the fastest one. It's like, it's not terribly sophisticated. Um, and so complex path link is, you know, doing a similar thing, except it's driven by this theory of like finding complex paths. The satisfying thing about complex path link is that you're actually just looking for like sufficiently wide bridges. And if you find that, then that's enough because now you know that there are wide enough bridges to carry this thing across the network. And so that principal measure actually does a lot of work. Now in the Malawi study, it's a really good example of like what this looks like in practice. Um, obviously in the microfinance study from India, they, they just had beautiful data. So we could you know, run, these, run these calculations. Um, but most of the consulting work I do, and Christina has had a lot of experience with this as well, you're talking to like NGOs or firms who are like, how do we, how do we wrap our heads around like these kinds of data that we've never had to collect before? Um, and what they did in the Malawi study, and this is you know much, really to their credit, is um, I said it was four years, and then I reported that you know year one, two, and three, right? That's because um, really it was year two, three, and four when they were collecting the data. In year one, they went around to all 200 villages and went around to every single family and did interviews and collected like the social network data. So not everyone has the time or the energy or the will to be that intensive in their data collection efforts. So there's an interesting proxy that comes up with geography, which is to say, well, if people are like kind of neighbors with each other or there's like a little region, can you use that as like a proxy for social networks? Um, and the answer is, it depends on how large your seed group is. If your seed group is like really tiny, then no, you really need to know the network structure because you really need to target neighbors of each other who have overlapping ties and wide bridges that are gonna sort of you know, diffuse for the network. But if you have like a sizable clump, 
then you can just target like one little neighborhood in a region. And most likely some of these people will know each other and you'll get these sort of reinforcing dynamics off the ground. So there are different ways of doing this. And actually the, the, the group, that sort of group of 50 villages, I mentioned there were four, right now we talked about three. Well, the fourth case was this neighborhood seeding case where they tried this approximation. They had very small seed groups. So this is why the, the complex centrality measure was the one that performed the best. Um, but the second best was actually the one that used the neighborhoods where they got lucky sometimes where neighbors knew each other and you got that sort of complex centrality reinforcement effect. So um, overall, I would say that the data collection can be quite intensive, but you can strategically uh, choose to, you know, experimental designs or intervention designs that make use of geographic locality as a way of, of sort of approximating network structure. Gabriela, could the mechanism you describe have to do with the role of trust in adoption? Yeah, so um, sorry for always plugging the book, but there's a, a chapter on this as well. So um, this particularly shows up, I, the example, I, I have a chapter on organizations, organizational change. I talk about culture and the culture, particularly of like gender and organizations and sexual harassment. Um, and one of the interesting things is that uh, when you look at, when you look at organizational change, I think one of the big factors that's often overlooked is that people are fundamentally always coordinating with each other. And coordination is one of like the least appreciated problems in social science, because in my view, and Christina and I have talked a lot about this, but in my view, coordination is what's fundamentally underneath social norms. We talk about cooperation and we talk about, you know, the issue of defection and so forth, but this is something that we explicitly think about. If we're going to defect, we know we're going to defect. Coordination is something we're doing all the time without noticing it. Like we're just rarely paying attention to it, which to my mind makes it much more powerful. It means that it's like an influence that's happening all the time on how we behave. And if you think about people in organizations and corporate context or in, even NGOs, any organizational context, if you can't coordinate with your peers, you can't do your job. You just can't work. And so you have to all the time kind of adjust your expectations, how long a meeting is, how long to have a conversation with someone, how often to talk to them, what to talk to them about, what conversations are appropriate. Do we talk about salary? Do we not talk about salary? Do we engage and talk about um, the leadership or do we not supposed to talk about things? These are all things people are just, I mean, our brains are so wired to understand and interpret social cues that what we don't appreciate is that we're, we're getting these all the time in this sort of complex way reinforcing signals and adjusting to them without even realizing it. And everyone's adjusting to us, right? So it's this, it's this sort of reciprocal thing. Um, and so trust is part of that, is that when you start to coordinate with someone, you start to feel comfortable with them. You start to understand the expectations they have of you and that you have of them. And so I feel like where trust comes in is really in these sorts of, I think, especially in organizational settings where being able to kind of see and adapt to other people in like a way that feels seamless and um, natural creates a feeling of trust in the sense that I have reliable expectations of you and I know your expectations of me. And so I think that trust is like a natural output of these, of these kinds of complex processes. Masood, you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, thank you, Damon, for the wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it. I would like to ask you uh, a question, then if there's time, a little bit of uh, a comment that I'd like to share with you. My question is, uh, so basically a lot of uh, times I can think about scenarios where the criteria that you identified uh, are met. Uh, so uh, ideas gain credence and then they're spread uh, like on the periphery, but even though there is a level of criticality and then critical mass is achieved uh, around periphery, they never make it to the center. Yeah. And uh, I'd like to know if you have any thoughts. So like, I'm a sociologist, I'm thinking about social movements. Right. Uh, there could be a lot of scenarios where uh, uh, certain uh, movements uh, gain credence on the periphery, but then they fail to make it to the center because they don't gain legitimacy because yeah. uh, the major influence uh, you know, in the center do not like the, their ideas. They try to block them, et cetera. So do we know any identifiable 
uh, pattern uh, or, or factors that, uh, you know, that predict success uh, and success in this context means making it to the central, uh, to the centrality of the, of the network. Uh, yeah. That's the question. And then I have a comment if there's time I'll share. Sure. Uh, no, it's a great question. It overlaps actually with Christina's question. So this is where the critical mass sort of concept comes in. And absolutely, it's the case that things gain traction all the time in the periphery and never really make it to the center. And the core deciding factor is, are there sufficient wide bridges, sufficient complex path length from this peripheral group into the rest of the network? Because what often happens is, and if you, the networks here, this is one reason why network science has kind of like taken over social science, is because there were a series of questions that social scientists simply couldn't answer. Um, and network science has basically said that's because everyone was looking at like monetary incentives or everyone was looking at institutions. And you completely missed the fact that like these networks were there governing this process underneath this all along. And one of the things about the question you're asking is like, oftentimes the peripheral group is actually less connected to the rest, rest of the sort of the, the network. And so as a result of that, there actually aren't enough wide bridges kind of the, to carry that innovation to like the rest of the, the population. Um, and you can see this actually really concretely in organizational context. There's very good network data in organizations because we know who everyone is, we know what groups they work in, we know what hallways they work on, right? You have like this, this beautiful data. And you can see that like, yeah, groups that are siloed that try to do some sort of initiative fail. And it happens all the time in organizations. Um, and one of the things that like that the organizational chapter in this book talks about is like, well, the way you solve this is not by becoming like a big networker. The way you solve this is by building wide bridges in your organization. And then guess what? You start to, you can actually shift the culture. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's a clear explanation for this stuff. Excellent. And on this note, I wanted, so when you were describing the, uh, the complex contagion, uh, it seems to me that, uh, I'm sure you have thought about this, but the idea, so structural whole, basically, uh, uh, Ronald yeah. Gordon's, uh, structural whole seems to have some implications when it comes to complex uh, contagion. Yeah describe and I was wondering uh, in what context you thought about uh, this or what implication the, the notion of a structural whole has in the context of uh, um, uh, uh, you know a complex contagion uh, yeah which, uh, no it's a, it's a good question it's, it's relevant to the, the points I was just making so um, prior to writing this book I wrote another book with Princeton Press that was like a more I would say more academic book that was a little bit more technical um, and that was called How Behavior Spreads. And it's, it's about like more like the theory of complex contagions and how it operates. But there is a chapter that specifically deals with Ron Birch structural holes theory. Um, and basically what goes on there, and I'm friends with Ron, we've talked about this a bunch, but like he basically obviously is assuming simple contagion. He's like the person who's gonna make, you know, what you, so there's two parts of what he's doing. So first of all, for those don't know, who don't know, um, if you ever take, and you probably will if you take a class at Warden, if you take like a business networking 101 class, you will probably be taught about structural holes. They may not use that terminology, but they'll basically say what you wanna do in terms of like building your profile, becoming a successful networker and, you know, getting your prestige in an organization is to make lots of ties and become kind of the person that people go to, to like learn about this and learn about that. Um, and this was, Really in 92, Ron Burt wrote this book where he basically said, hey, you know, organizations are often siloed. You have one group doing something over here, another group does nothing about it. If you can be the, the person who like makes friends with the people over here in engineering and also makes friends with the people over here in manufacturing, then like you'll find out what's going on in both these areas and you can be the information broker. And, you know, that his argument was that performs a service for the organization and also you become a star. You get like lots of people start to know you and you become the person, the go-to person, which gives you even more ties. And you start to look a lot like that image that I showed you, where you've got basically the firework explosion weak tie networks. And so that intuition of structural holes was very much built on Grant Avedder's intuition of weak ties. It was like, become the person that's like at the center of the star, become that highly central person in your organization. And you'll get raises, you'll get promotions, you'll become well-known, you'll get right. So that's all fine from the perspective of like me as an individual. But this is interesting because it introduces like a kind of a prisoner's dilemma where if we then shift to complex contagion, 
that person who has lots of these you know, ties is very good for information diffusion. But if you're trying to initiate a change in organizational culture, right, where you're trying to get like lots of reinforcing connections, that person who's highly connected has a strong disincentive to, tr to allow wide bridges to form because their, their power and their influence comes from exclusivity. They're the only person with these ties everywhere. And what wide bridges fundamentally are, are like reinforcing multiple ties across groups. And so strategically, it's a totally different project to create wide bridges in organization for culture change than it is to create personal prestige in organization through information spread. Um, and so that's, I think, a really useful kind of shift in thinking when it comes to like what our objective is. So I can say more about that. You can also refer to the book, but but yeah, there's a lot to say that certainly these have implications for Ron Burke's work. Thank you. Sure. Alex, you had your hand open for quite a long time. Yes, uh, thanks Dr. Santella for this great talk. I'm in Betsy Pollock's lab and I've been a huge fan of your research. Oh, so. Great. Um, so are, you at, are you at Princeton or are you here? I'm at Princeton, yeah. Okay. Um, I was curious, you mentioned um, kind of thresholds for action and how they can't be measured um, ex ante. I'm curious like if you know of researcher that tries to approximate what people's individual thresholds would be yeah. and then tries to then kind of um, have that inform whatever the network targeting algorithm is. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. The thresholds thing has been kind of a, a bit of a cross to bear for sociology for about, I don't know, since the seventies. Um, so it was a project, so, you know, generationally, it was a project of the scholars in the seventies and eighties. And, and Mark Granovetter, who wrote The Strength of Weak Ties also wrote, you know, the, the classic threshold model of collective behavior. Um, so he and I have talked about this a lot. And um, there was an agenda set in the late 70s, early 80s to sort of go about measuring thresholds. And Mark was in the forefront of this. He said, we should do this. And nothing much happened with it. And it's not because people didn't try. It's because actually, if you, if you try to think through it properly, it can't be done. So if I say um, it's thresholds as like pure concepts independent of a network and a diffusion process, are unproductive scientifically. And this is something that's not been fully appreciated. Um, so let's just reason it through very quickly. If you were to run an experiment where you measure people's thresholds, right? Then you would say, okay, let's, let's, let's run an experiment and we give you these various things and we see after how many people you adopt, okay? It's not even a number. And the question is, what's that number good for? Because the next time this person experiences something that's similar to the thing that you just tested them on, they've actually been through an adoption phase with that thing. So is their threshold the same or is it different now? Because they're not the same person than before the first experiment. There's someone who's been through an experiment, who's adopted a behavior that's very similar to the thing that you want to test them on, right? In addition to that, thresholds themselves are contextually they're, they're contingent, right? Various things are happening. There are secular trends. There's different sort of environmental factors. And these, uh, these sort of reference points for like how much influence I need can change. And we experience this ourselves all the time. We experience like sometimes I'm feeling like a little bit more susceptible and other times I'm not. So the, the quick answer to that is to say, okay, thresholds aren't like a number. They're a distribution. Basically, you have a mean and it's a probability distribution. Then I say, okay, is it really a probability distribution over an individual or is it a probability distribution over a population, right? And you can say, well, we can approximate that computationally, right, by saying there's a distribution over a population. I say, right, so now we're getting now into the space where I work, which is to say, we don't know exactly what any one given person's threshold will be. And uh, methodologically, it's kind of a wrong concept because a lot of social scientists, um, and even network scientists have made kind of fall into this trap of talking about like low threshold people and high threshold people. And what I want to emphasize is that all of these descriptions are post hoc. They're like something happened. It's very much like the description of saying you've got a diffusion curve, which everyone knows that sigmoidal diffusion curve. And you say at the beginning, we have early adopters. In the middle, we have regular people. At the beginning, at the end, we have laggards, right? That is a description of a time series. It's not a description of people, right? You have the people who are adopted at the beginning 
may just have been located in the periphery around other adopters, and that's where the diffusion curve is growing the slowest, right? And those are the people who are adopting early because they were around the seeds. And then the middle is actually when the diffusion process is speeding up, which is why you see that acceleration. It's not about the people themselves, it's about this sort of network process. And then at the end, it reaches the far parts of the network, so it's slower and we call them laggards. And, and, and this is often called the ecological fallacy, where you describe a collective process and then you try to attribute individual traits. And in other parts of social science, people have been really attuned, often in observational data analysis, people are really attuned to the ecological fallacy. So, okay, there's a description of a population, and then we try to assume that if you have a dis, you know, distribution of thresholds, that actually means that that distribution probabilistically is in everyone's head, or that you know that distribution maps onto every single person in the population. So you have this many zeros, this many ones, this many twos, right? Um, it is just uh, theoretically not possible to build a proper inferential machine that can do that. And methodologically, it's improper to make those kinds of inferences from population level distributions to individual um, tendencies, behaviors, so forth. Uh, and so in network science and with thresholds, this is like people have been kind of a little bit slower to catch up because we've kind of reified the threshold concept and treated it as like a thing that describes a person. Um, it's very much like this, uh, this way that we used to describe influencers as like, this person is charismatic. Like there's something about them. It's like, okay, we pull back out and have it as structural description. It's like, well, I can put anyone in that spot. It's something about the structure. It's sort of similar with thresholds. Threshold is, is, a, is a process of adoption in a context, in a network based on the signals and based on your neighborhood, really. Um, and so those things can change. And so what matters is saying uh, in this distribution at the population level, there's a robust description of how contagions will spread. And we don't really know who is where. And quite frankly, this is you know, a kind of epistemological argument. We can't know. It's not the kind of thing you can measure, like a person's threshold, um, either in general or for a specific thing. Because as I said, if you did a series of psychology experiments, you just measured them and they know that you measured them and they adopted these things. So their, their actual mental states have changed as a result of that process. So there's no uh, essentialist or intrinsic concept of a threshold that would be appropriate to use or scientifically useful. Um, I hope that's helpful for sort of fleshing out the broader, the broader oh, space here. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. It has been absolutely fantastic, Damon. Thank you so very much. For those of you who still have questions, reach out to Damon on Instagram or let us know your questions and we'll seek to get them to Damon to get you some answers. Thank you so very much for everyone who attended today. And thank you for Damon for the fantastic talk. Thank you. My to pleasure. My pleasure. And thank you for your, for, your, for your engagement and your excellent questions. <laughs>